This gentleman back here. I've got yours. Let me uh, get this mic. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Omar Davis. I'm a practicing civil engineer uh, in the Washington, D.C. area and abroad. In the early 90s, uh, I represented at Howard University and several hundred civil engineering students, and we had taken a trip, literally locked, knocked on the doors of the World Bank at the time. We had very ambitious, full of ideas, um, full of vigor um, in terms of development, and really to echo what Aisha was saying, we had representatives, um, students, attending uh, Howard University from several continents throughout the diaspora. Uh, and we literally knocked on the doors of, of the World Bank and we were invited to one meeting and it never you know, followed up um, from there. My question is, the report stated uh, the recruitment of um, engineers, the recruitment of um, those in finance are pretty much done at the Ivy League. I'd like to know um, what can be done right now Howard University is in our backyard, and I would say that there are brilliant engineers, finance managers at that institution. What can be done now to make a change? Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing that up. We are doing what the, is called the sourcing in human resource language, which means to find candidate and to map um, uh, available candidates and suitable candidates. So that is actually a strong effort. We have a senior colleague um, trained on gender diversity who is doing that uh, right now in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. So she just sent me a very long mail before I come here with a long list of organizations and partners in the university that we're working with. I would also like to work with Howard University because it is here. And I must say that <coughs> these things are not um, uh, as easy as they sound. Because when I start talking about Howard University, some of my colleagues who are very committed to gender diversity, um, they say that nobody needs to recruit people from the region. So I had to explain that out of the 12, 15 volunteers we had at the conference who came from here, I had to explain to my colleague that, colleagues that they were actually quite qualified from their back, um, country back home. Some of them had like five or eight years of uh, professional experience from from uh, Mexico and Brazil when they were African descendants. So I agree, we can find you here. We're gonna take uh, two more, three more questions actually. And what I'd like to do is, is hear the questions and then we're gonna get a response from up here. Now, everybody try and keep it somewhat brief. Think about what you're gonna say and uh, I'm coming over this direction to, uh, to start the dialogue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando de Lipa. Uh, I am the staff attorney of the Indian Law Resource Center. Uh, at the center, we represent uh, Indian governments in the U.S. and in Latin America on litigation, basically, concerning their collective uh, human rights. Uh, and we also monitor policies for banks. And I have two issues to raise. One is concerning human resources, and the other one concerning policies, at the IDB especially. Uh, the one concerning human resources, um, if you go to Latin America, if you, at the IDV, start uh, taking into account who are indigenous professionals, you will find that only one person is indigenous. And that is a lawyer from Guatemala that I think replaced Carlos Vitieri, uh, what used to be the unit of gender and diversity. Uh, yeah. Now, in this region, indigenous peoples have been historically discriminated since the creation of the existing nation states. That's why we are representing them and trying to use the legal remedies to advance their rights within the legal system that these nation states have developed. And that is something that you should be aware of in terms of human resources. Now, in terms of policies, we are here talking about discrimination and discrimination is a human rights language. Carlos Quesada from Rural Rights can tell you that the principle of non-discrimination is a parentary norm of international law that has been evolved since uh, World War II. 
Now, there is no human rights approach at the IDB. Amen. There is no human rights approach at the World Bank. The World Bank is at least discussing internally how they are going to introduce human rights into their operational practices and policies. But there is nothing like that at the IDB. If we want to take a look at something that is going on in the same field, in the private sector, we can learn from what the International Finance Corporation is doing. They are developing a human rights impact assessment guide. But nothing like that is being done at the IDB and at the World Bank. So I do want to have a discussion at the highest level, both at the IDB and the World Bank, about this issue. The only answer that you are going to get when raising these issues is we are considering human rights in operational policies. And what we are going to be discussing then is operational policies in economic language, something that was uh, highlighted by Carlos uh, Quesada, but not in straightforward human rights language. And this is international law, something that has been developed at the United Nations, and here in this region, the Inter-American Human Rights System has developed a lot of human rights standards concerning the rights of African descendants and the rights of indigenous people. So I do encourage all of you to take a look at these issues. Thanks. We're going to have Carlos, uh, he's going to definitely uh, respond. We want to hear from Carlos again because he's very articulate. Hold on, one more question. My name is Ben Anderson. Um, I have to confess, and I've been telling GAP what a great job they did to bring people there today. I'm a former client of GAP, a successful client of GAP, so thank you. Um, you have legal problems, go to Gap. Um, but what I'd like to say is I have a little experience with the American Development Bank, having written 26 uh, newspaper articles, magazine articles about corruption at the IDB about six years ago. And after the end of 20, those 26 article, articles, the President of the Bank resigned and they announced that they were doing all these new things on anti-corruption, uh, which I guess is good news, except you have to remember the old Spanish saying, Obedezco, the Spanish colonial saying, obedezco, pero no cumplo. I obey, but I don't uh, carry out. And today, people tell me I don't have any uh, things to denounce here, but people tell me that things haven't changed all that much. One of the problems that I encountered, and it goes back to who is staffing the bank, is when I talk to people in the human resources, they said about 40% of the people are useless at the bank. They basically don't do their job. They are there because they have double last names, they come from the oligarchy where they're, where they're very wealthy. They're friends, lovers, or brothers and sisters of people of means and political connections, and they don't do anything. You cannot expect change from those people. So when you're talking about real fundamental change, I think Vince Malcolm did a wonderful job in talking about that. I think you also have to talk about, okay, is it time for buyouts? Because in the long term, given the misery that the bank policies often perpetrate on the client countries, it's time to talk about buying people out in Washington so that people in places that are far away may live a little better. I'll give you one, and I'll stop. There's one, uh, there was one study that was done on lending a billion dollars to Nicaragua about six years ago. And they did, they very honest with the bank, they did an internal evaluation, they didn't want it public, but in the internal evaluation that I made public, it said that there was nothing that they could trace that, that the bank had done to positively affect life in Nicaragua. Well, let me tell you something. Give me a billion dollars, and I'll tell you some ways you can help blacks, indigenous people, and other people who are disenfranchised as a way of changing it. It's, it's really necessary for people to get together and speak loudly. So replenishment is one thing. People will nod and say, really good thought. We'll keep it in mind. But you got to stay active after the replenishment. Otherwise, it's obedezco, pero no Thank you. Well, um, I have a question about when are we going to recognize in terms of policy, to have a formal recognition of the Afro-descendants of the Americans. My name's Marion. A lot of people in here know me, Marion Douglas Mungaro. I've worked with World Bank. I've worked with the Organization of American States, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, in the U.S. Congress, and elsewhere. And I've had a hell of a time career-wise. I was born like seven blocks from here. 
I am a black American. I have nothing against people who become US citizens who are from other places. But we have a US black population and we know who we are and everybody here who's not from that population knows who they are too. And it's very unfair. Uh, I worked in the Balkans with Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. There were four black people. One of them, Ethiopian background. Born in the US, Ethiopian, both parents. Another fellow, Nigerian, who had been a graduate student in Iowa. And he had US citizenship or permanent residency. Then there was a young lady who self-identified correctly, and God bless her, as Caribbean American. I love her for it. But why was I 25% of the black people sent by the United States government, and I was the only black person whose family was enslaved in this country, built this country, and you can't get a job. The same thing in the World Bank and elsewhere. I can find black people. I just can't find any from here. I talked with colleagues, and I've, I've lived in Nairobi, I've been in Addis Ababa, I've been in Tunisia, um, you know, worked in Haiti, Nicaragua, Peru, etc. Lived in Skopje, Macedonia, worked in Kosovo, etc. But when I work in Kosovo, the largest, the most visible group of black women that I identified with at the time was a group of ladies working for the UN, all Ethiopian. And they kind of adopted me. In spite of the fact that I come from, quote unquote, the most powerful country in the world, I, that, that freaks me out on a regular basis. Because then why is it that I speak five languages, I study eight? This is my hometown, and I cannot get a job in international affairs. In spite of the fact that President Aristide of Haiti, former president, knows that my boss that I worked with on Haiti policy helped him to get back to Haiti in 1994. And there's plenty of people who've worked with me and they know the quality of my work. I want to recommend a book, which is Eyes Off the Prize by Carol Anderson. The subtitle is The United Nations and the Human Rights Struggle of African Americans. Well, this is not a new thing. And the United Nations has known what was going on over here all the time. That's why they built Bretton Woods, the club, so they wouldn't have to go through the civil rights fights here to integrate public you know, and other accommodations in the city of Washington. So I just really would like for the Afro-descendants, because indigenous people are recognized in international law. The slavery descendants, I don't care what country we're from in the Americas, I don't care. Right now we need to identify we have a right, and I say this to my sisters and brothers from Africa, that the black people who've been here for the last 500 plus years, starting with Bolivia, we have a right to be recognized as a visible, known, population with international legal rights as Afro-descendants descended from people who were enslaved here. Thank you very much. This is a, a very uh, powerful message and uh, I'm going to be doing an interview with the president of the NAACP and I'm hoping to remember what you said. Thank you. It's, it's very uh, powerful. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you, Mary, and it's strange we haven't met because we've been to many of the same places. My last employer was the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and I must say I was surprised that we had only one African-American uh, person, a woman working there. She's no longer working there. I was really surprised. Two is intact. Hi, my name is Gloria, and I don't work for any organization. I just have here to see what's going on. And I did know that the, everybody, all the groups are represented, the Africans, the Latinas, the uh, women, uh, men, etc., etc. But how about the American indigenous, the people who are originally from here, the U.S. indigenous? Is there anybody who represented them? You do? But I can't yeah, hear anything. Too. No? Okay, I just want to say, everybody knows that those people who are the ones who've been here forever, and they are the first ones, the only ones. They don't have enough schools, they don't have programs. Does they, any of the in, uh, groups who are child represented here, I mean, the organization do anything to help those people? No. No? no. Well, again, uh, don't you think that, that we should all do something about it? Nobody represents anything. Why? I think they've been discriminated forever. It's not a secret that U.S. Uh, Government being abusing things forever, and they still uh, do it, and we still don't do nothing. They are our brothers, come on. And the other hand, uh, I know the the American, the indigenous museum here in DC is an insult to them. You know, they didn't spend too much money to do that museum, and they don't even have enough food in the tables. 
And I brought, my point is this, I just uh, wake up to asking you to call your conscience and think twice when you're giving away this money to different countries, Papa, how about the people from here, the ones who has no voice? Thank you. I just want to make a really quick announcement. That's going to have to be our last question, so we're going to end on the card. Um, well, no, I, I, Renata, right? I think uh, I, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying. I think what I was mentioning about the human rights approach to development uh, is really necessary. I think poverty and inequality in Latin America is the consequence of the human rights violation, basically, the right to an, uh, employment, housing, health, etc. Those are human rights. Education. And I think education, exactly. I think uh, once um, the economists understand that, <laughs> And once those who work in human rights understand that they can work together, um, I think um, you know, we, we can actually contribute a lot, uh, both, you know, those working on human rights and those working on, on, on the economic, quote, uh, side of, of, of the field, of the soccer field. I just want to say that it's great that you're inviting the UN Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism. We definitely need to get in touch. Because um, uh, uh, the former special rapporteur came to the United States a year and a half ago, and uh, it gave a lot of recommendations to the United States, but mm, some of those recommendations actually apply also to, to some Latin American countries. Too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. make just a few remarks at the end. And I first of all want to thank people for, um, for coming and speaking their minds and sharing thoughts. Um, it's clear people here are committed to development, as are we at the bank. I agree with much of what's been said. I want to publicly disagree with one of the comments that 40% of my colleagues are useless. Um, I work with a group of committed people. I work with a group of committed people in the Gender and Diversity Unit. The education group has some world class has world class people, the social protection group, the infrastructure group. I think that was grossly unfair. And I challenge that. It came from inside the bank, from human resources, the people that I interviewed. <laughs> um, I would defy you to find that 40% among the groups, uh, either in HR here today or in my group, um, in any of them. I didn't include you, Andrew, because I think you would work. <laughs> That's, that's a little consolation. We can, we, can, we can continue this discussion. I just needed to strongly note my disagreement with that comment. Um, the other thing, I wanted to address your comment on human rights, because I think it's fundamental. I think there is good work on human rights. It's currently being done at the IDB, but it is not in the IDB's policy. And this relates to Adria's comment earlier. If folks want to have a debate about the mission of the IDB, that, and to include human rights, in, the promotion of human rights in our charter, that's a legitimate, legitimate discussion to have about to whether the charter should be not only promoting socioeconomic development, but promoting human rights. But in the indigenous people's policy of the bank, there are human rights elements, and all projects are, are subject to review for their impact on indigenous people's human rights, the resettlement policy in the same way. So it's sort of indirect in the safeguards, are, in safeguards language but the broader question, I think, is a, is a reasonable question. Perhaps. But there's nothing like that for the Afro-descendants, right? Impact policy for Afro-descendants. The, the bank does not currently have a policy on African descendants. And again, that is a legitimate question. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, Tina has some t-shirts she's going to hand out. Uh, Door. We have some articles uh, that are near the door as well. Some pieces that I've written. I'm going to give the microphone to Pete. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully, this is the first of many meetings.